Okay, hello everyone. Welcome and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2013 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with the Del Agua Health and Development Program, and our guest presenter is Christina Barstow. My name is Scott Frank, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with One Earth Designs, where I'm the co-founder and CEO. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar on the subject of strengthening implementation and monitoring of a large-scale water and energy program in Rwanda. Water and energy are key focus areas at E4C, and they're particularly interested in monitoring and evaluation methods. So we're especially glad to have Del Agua's program manager, Christina, join us today to share some insights and lessons learned from the field. Before we get rolling, I'd also like to take a moment to recognize the amazing coordinators of the E4C webinar series. That's Yana Aranda of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, Victoria Chung, Alex Torres of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series, so thank you all. We couldn't be doing this here without you. And certainly this initiative uh, is much due to your hard work, and we all owe you a lot for that. So if anyone out there has any questions about the series, you're encouraged to contact the E4C team via the email address that's visible here on this slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we hand things over to our presenter for today, we thought it would be a good idea to remind you about Engineering for Change and who they are. E4C is a global community of now over 13,000 technically-minded individuals, such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGO, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether that be in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas that many people are facing around the world today. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of the coalition, including professional societies like Engineers Without Borders USA, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, ASHRAE, academic supporters like MIT's D-Lab, a host of other acronyms, including international development agencies like USAID and Practical Action, as well as access to a passionate and engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. You can do that on the website that's listed below. So check that out to learn more and sign up. The webinar you're participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for a Change webinar series. This free and publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring leading-edge technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found at the Engineering for Change webinars webpage, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. If you're on Twitter, I'd also you invite you to join the conversation here, E4C webinars hashtag. So please use that while we're in the presentation by Christina. And just a note that E4C's next webinar will be on May 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you can pencil that in. That will be with Barrett Prins from One Acre Fund on Careers in International Development. As usual, please register via the E4C webinars webpage. While you're there, you'll also be able to find out about the May 9th webinar on a low-cost telehealth project in rural Nicaragua. Now, just a few more housekeeping items before we get started. First, let's see where everyone is from today. In the chat window, please type your location. Any technical questions or administrative problems should go into the chat window. Feel free to send a private chat to Holly or Yana, who are also listed in that drop-down box. You can also use the chat window to type any remarks you may have. 
During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat window to type in your questions for the presenter. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting the stop and then start button. If that does not work, you can use the call-in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening WebEx in a different browser like Firefox. Following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please provide your full name and date you completed this webinar, as well as the code that we will give you at the end of the session. Send this to eab-ceuadmin at ieee.org, which is listed there on the screen. Okay, today's presenter is Christina Barstow. We're very happy to have you here on the webinar. Thank you so much. Christina is the program manager for the Delagua Health and Development Program. Christina primarily focuses on education and training, as well as the monitoring and evaluation of the program. Additionally, Christina is very well qualified. She's a PhD student in the Mortensen Center in Engineering for Developing Communities at the University of Colorado at Boulder, one of my favorite places in the world. Christina has been working in Rwanda for the past five years on the research and implementation of appropriate technologies in the energy and water sector, including ultraviolet water treatment solutions, rainwater catchment systems, and high-efficiency cook stoves. Christina, you have been up to a lot. <laughs> so thank you. And now we'd like to open it up and uh, turn it over to Christina to present. Great, thank you so much. Um, do I now have control here? Great. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the Del Agua Health and Development Program that's been um, happening for about a year now. I'm going to focus primarily on our pilot findings. We ran a pilot in October, and I'll, I'll get into the details of that, but then also kind of what we're up to next and, and what our full-scale plans are. So just a brief background on uh, Del Agua. Del Agua is actually a company known for water testing kits. Um, they've been selling and supplying water testing kits to developing countries, uh, to, um, um, to developing countries. Mostly they're portable testing kits. Um, they have an incubator feature um, that lets you do microbiological testing. Um, Last year, Del Agua Health was founded with the um, with, with what they wanted to do was actually do a, an implementation program. So they contracted um, a company that I work for called Mana Energy Limited, and we are the ones that are actually implementing the Del Agua Health program in Rwanda. Um, one of the most important parts of this program is that we have a lot of in-country partners, primarily um, the Ministry of Health. Uh, they're the primary partner on this program and, and are seen as, as the primary implementers. Um, also the Ministry of Local Government and also um, as far as on the technology side, we work with Vestergaard Freudsen and I'll talk about their technology, which is the water filter and the EcoZoom cook stove, um, which is the cook stove and then Paradigm and Perspectives, working on business plans and some of the financial stuff. Um, there's also a huge research program involved um, within the larger program. That includes the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, Berkeley Air Monitoring Group, Portland State University, um, University of Colorado at Boulder, where I'm at, and uh, the University of Zurich. So just briefly on how this program is financed, um, what we're working with is carbon credits for water and cook stoves, and basically this falls under the United Nations Clean Development Mechanism, which is an international treaty um, that creates carbon credit markets so by offsetting the use of wood, um, we can you get a carbon credit for each ton of carbon removed or not admitted, and those are purchased by industries, um, which is the main revenue stream for the program. Um, the revenue from the carbon credits will mostly pay for operation and maintenance. These are long-term commitments. Um, we're looking at about 20 years of carbon credits coming in from that. Additionally, um, we're looking at a nationally appropriate mitigation action, and this is a bilateral development which brings together um, donors, the private sector, and a local government partner, and all comes under 
into NAMA funding for this program. It operates very, very similarly to the carbon market as far as metrics. And one thing, the important thing to note about the carbon market and, and also the NAMA here is uh, the requirements for monitoring of these programs is extensive. So in, in getting carbon credits, we have to do a very, very extensive monitoring program and prove what we're doing and do a lot of surveying and back checks and validation. And so these pay-for-performance models um, inherently make monitoring much more robust and um, much more sustainable in our, in our program. Um, so our previous experience is actually with a large rollout with Vestergaard Freudson in Kenya. They did a large rollout of their life straw family water filters to almost 900,000 households in a campaign style, which is what we're going to do, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, using community health workers, this was a $30 million program, um, but basically they blanket covered um, a large, all of Western Kenya, or a huge province in Western Kenya, and MANA um, was originally involved with the development of that program and, and working on that program. So moving into Rwanda, um, Rwanda is a very, very progressive country. Um, it actually has the fastest decline in child mortality. Um, a lot of the reasoning for that is they really do have a very strong um, Ministry of Health, very strong um, health structure, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, soon. But then, but additionally, they do still have a lot of work to do. Um, the number one or the major causes of under five mortality are pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, and AIDS. And, this program really focuses on uh, those top two, uh, which is pneumonia and diarrhea. So our deployment, plan, deployment plans at full scale, which is next summer, is the distribution of water filters and cook stoves to all 30 districts in Rwanda. We'll be covering about a third of the total population. We're, targeted, we're targeting what's called Udehe economic level one and two. So the country actually separates every household into what's an Ubudehe category uh, based on assets. And so we're going to be targeting the lower two economic classes, so the poorest third of the country. This is about 600,000 households. Um, so yeah, it's going to happen in June 2014. It's a 20-year program. Um, in addition to just the, the first kind of campaign and the rollout, we do follow-up visits, but there's also um, a maintenance, maintenance center so, set up everywhere, and that's a continuing part of the program is um, the continued maintenance and monitoring of all of the technologies. Um, in July of last year, we did a small pilot of 100 households, and then in October, we did a, a larger pilot, which I'd call phase one, of 2,000 households. Um, this is what I'm primarily going to focus on today as far as the results that we've seen in the past six months since the, the phase one deployment. <clears throat> so the way the program is designed is, is through a health campaign. So we use the Ministry of Health community health workers. They have already been trained by the Ministry of Health. Um, they go through extensive training based on which programs they're working on, malaria, um, maternal health, those type of things. And we take them in and we train them on our program. This includes uh, training on how to use a smartphone, which we'll talk about in a minute, and also the technologies we work with, how to perform an education visit, um, because they do live and work in the communities, in all the communities. Uh, additionally, we're using another portion of the Ministry of Health, which is an environmental health officer. They're a full-time employee, and we use them more for some of our quality monitoring, um, longer surveying, where a community health worker is more education-based. Um, our program really, really is about household level intervention with education and training. So every single household in our program receives a household visit um, and many, many follow-up household visits after that. That's probably the most important point when it comes to uptake and adoption of technologies is the face-to-face, one-on-one interactions with households um, in a frequent manner. Additionally, at large scale, we'll definitely be doing some social marketing. Um, other ways to get into uh, households and, and into people's minds is through radio and through schools and things like that. Um, regular monitoring and follow-up. We use smartphones and also some sensor-based technologies um, that, that do our follow-up surveys and, and some of our monitoring. Um, again, those district repair and replacement centers. Um, and then also we have a very large impact research program being 
mostly done by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And they're looking at both uptake, but also exposure reduction, and then ultimately at those health outcomes. On top of the health campaign that targets the lowest 30% uh, of the population, we will also roll out a retail plan at the same time that will allow the other Ubudehe categories to um, buy the products. So at the same time as the health campaign, we'll also roll out them um, at the retail scale. Um, the health campaign will also serve as, as a commercial promotion um, for those other folks to come in and buy them. Um, we're currently working on a market study to look at price points and, and target markets and, and things like that. So moving into the technologies, uh, the, stove, the stove technology that we're working with right now is called the EcoZoom Dura Cook Stove. It's a wood-burning cook stove. It reduces wood, uses, wood usage by at least 50%. Um, it reduces indoor air pollution, um, cooks faster, saves money. Uh, it's somewhat portable and durable uh, with about a five-year lifespan. The water technology is the Vester Gudfridsen Life Straw Family 2.0. This is a point-of-use tabletop uh, device. It filters about 18,000 liters, and it's an uh, ultrafiltration membrane. It will last for about three to five years for a family of five. Um, and the great thing about uh, membrane filtration is you don't have any chemical taste or odor issues like you would see with chlorine or, or some other um, point-of-use technologies. A large part of our program is the use of smartphones for data collection. So we use a program called DoForms. Um, all of our surveys are done via this app on a smartphone. We train community health workers on how to use a smartphone and then specifically on our surveys. And this can include getting GPS coordinates. All of our technologies are barcoded, so they take barcodes. Um, they take household and identifying information. We can take pictures at the house. Um, so it's a really great data collection um, for us, especially at, when we go to scale at 600,000 households. It's really important that we're able to manage that um, data. Okay, so a few about a year ago, we the first thing we did was a baseline survey, and um, this was really to see how where Rwanda is right now on some of the metrics that we look at on the cooking and water treatment side. Um, we surveyed about 60 households in each of the 11 districts. Um, not only is this just a look for us at what's going on now, this is required for carbon offset projects. Again, part of the extensive um, use of, of carbon financing makes it we have to do extensive baseline surveys and, and, and see what's going on. So the baseline water treatment method in Rwanda is boiling. Uh, we have about 46% of households reporting um, boiling as their treatment mechanism, and you see 36% of uh, households reporting not um, using any water treatment method, um, about 15% using Siro, and that's a chlorine, um, liquid chlorine, and then other filters, pure, um, and other. Baseline primary cook cooking fuel, the majority of households, about 85%, are actually using fuel wood versus charcoal. Um, which is around the 15% mark. Um, a lot of the other uh, fuel sources haven't um, really been in Rwanda very long, and so we're seeing mostly wood usage. And again, you're going to see a little bit more charcoal usage in, in urban areas versus rural areas, um, but mostly wood in Rwanda. Uh, baseline stove type, the, about 50% of households are using three stone fires, and that's your traditional, um, that's your traditional cook stove, basically campfire. Um, that you cook over. Uh, Ronda Reza and Imbabura are locally made slightly improved um, cook stoves and then mud wood stove and charcoal cook stove, but the majority of people are, are cooking on um, basically a three-stone fire. Okay, so in October we did a pilot and we had 15 villages in 11 districts across western Rwanda. This is approximately 2,000 households and involved the training of 150 community health workers and 17 environmental health officers and, and hygiene club presidents. The way we do um, the distribution is we call a community meeting where everyone in the community shows up um, and we do a, a presentation on how to use the technologies and, and go through some of the messaging. And then people basically get in the queue and 
we distribute the technologies to them using the smartphones. We take the barcodes. We take their personal information. Um, and then they take the technologies home with them. Right after that happens, um, we do a household education visit. So that same day or the next day, those community health workers then go into every home and train households on how to use the technologies and go through that messaging as far as health and advantages of using the stove or filter um, or disadvantages of, of using a three-stone fire um, and train them how to use it. This also happens um, several months later, too, and I'll get into that. Um, but taking GPS coordinates at houses, we are continually tracking where technologies are. We can look at barcodes and GPS coordinates um, to see if filters and cookstoves have moved um, and directly track usage to the household level. This is just a map of western Rwanda and, and where those villages are located. Um, those three villages that are highlighted in blue are specifically the ones that um, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine did studies in, and they did a randomized control trial, which I'm, I'm not going to get into their results today, but um, they basically did an intervention group and a control group looking at exposure reduction from the actual technologies. Okay, so after the, after the distribution in October, we started what we call the follow-up campaign. And every month since October, we've done monthly visits um, to the households. Um, so far, we have four rounds complete. The last round is um, happening right now. Uh, but there were two surveys going on. One was the community health worker survey, which was just education-based. Uh, so they went into households. They asked about 10 questions, very sim simple about usage. But their primary focus is seeing if people know how to use the technologies, if not re-educating them on how to do it, um, and having them demonstrate use. This happens for every household every month. And then the other survey was an environmental health officer survey. This was a portion of the population done every, one, every month. This is a much longer survey. It was over 100 questions. Um, but let us get at you know, socioeconomic status and really look at water and cooking practices and, and figure out why or why not um, people are, are using the technologies. Um, the, the table at the bottom there is just to kind of show the number of surveys that came in for each round. Um, so on the, for the environmental health officer, which is the longer survey, um, it was about 350 or so uh, surveys per round. And then the community health worker survey was about 2,000 or, or 1,900, the whole population. Additionally, as I mentioned before, we really we have to segregate out the Ubudehe 1 and 2, the lowest economic classes. Um, for future for the full rollout. So during this pilot phase, we covered a whole village, so all economic status. And then, but in our full program, we will only be covering Ubudehe 1 and 2. So we wanted to look at that data as well to see if we were seeing any differences between, in adoption between an, an Ubudehe 1 and 2 household, the lower economic class, um, over the whole population. Um, and so just one note is uh, when you look at this total column, um, environmental health officers are added up for each round, whereas the community health workers total are an average um, between rounds. So the way that the household visits worked is there were three community health workers um, from each village that were selected to perform the household education visit, visits. The environmental health officers attended a two-day training. So this was all after our additional training that we did during campaign. There was another training that was just for this survey. It's very long. Um, and then the EHOs also um, did refresher trainings for the community health workers the day, the morning of or the day before each follow-up um, round was administered. The community health workers were evaluated on proper use of a smartphone and the ability to perform the survey and household education before they were um, allowed to go into homes and actually perform visits. Uh, we also, because we were going into households every month, uh, we were able to make changes and, and every round based on the feedback that we were getting from field staff. Um, we, we did some focus group meetings um, and just some of the data we received. So just a, just a sampling of kind of what we would do um, every month is we may add or reword a survey question, so we would get feedback that um, the way we're asking a question, you know, isn't really working. 
Um, additional or stressed education messages. So um, I'll get into a minute on some of the three stone fire messages, but it might be that we really wanted to stress the disadvantages of three stone fires. Um, we can also look at enumerator performance numbers in, in real time, so the number of surveys and the time they spent in households. Um, and also we did some more programmatic things with our staff as far as talking to local officials and things like that. So a lot of this stuff is enabled because we use a smartphone-based system because we can get um, data in relatively real time or, or, or close to real time. Um, we can react and, and make changes to our program fairly quickly. Okay, so moving into the stove adoption numbers. A lot of what I'm going to focus on right now is uptake. Um, that's one of the primary, you know, that's primarily what we want to see. And what we're concerned about is, is, is good uptake. And that's really hard. And what you're going to see here is a lot of what I think are really good numbers. And I want to stress that the reason that we're seeing such good uptake in our households is because we are constantly doing education and training in the household. So, we look at, at adoption two different ways, and, and that's through a reported metric and also through an observed metric. So a reported metric is the enumerator asking, what stove did you use, or what is your primary cook stove? Um, of those households, we saw about 90% um, of, of households um, report use of the cook stove. We also use an observational measure. Um, this is a bit difficult on the, on the stove side because it's actually kind of difficult to observe if someone has been using it. Um, so we use a discoloration observation um, method. It's imperfect, and um, inherently the stove gets discolored every or discolored very quickly. So we see about 96% observed EcoZoom use. Um, normally on the observation side, you'll see lower than reported, and, and you'll see that in the, in the water one. But it's an imperfect measure. So, but we want both a reported metric and an observed metric of use. Um, also in that pie chart, part, pie chart there, you'll see about 90% um, of people reported EcoZoom use. And then the, what else is coming out of there is three stone fire use still at 5% and other 4.7%. Um, I want to stress that this is a question that asks if this is their primary stove. Um, and I'll get into a minute if they're using other stoves. So moving into cooking location, this is really important for us on the health side. Um, we message strongly, and it's very important that we want people to move outside to cook. Um, when asked, what's your primary cooking location, most households report cooking outdoors, which is what we want, with um, you know, the remaining 40% uh, moving, um, cooking indoors or in a separate kitchen. What you can see here is, again, I, I parsed out all households versus Ubudehe, one and two households, and, and we're really not seeing huge differences between the two populations. Additionally, going back to the last slide, last slide we're also not seeing drop-off or significant differences between rounds. So each round represents one month uh, or so um, of adoption. So we actually haven't seen uh, much drop-off in the usage um, of the technologies. Fuel wood reduction, um, this is characterized by asking households how many bundles of wood they used previously and how many bundles of wood they use now. And we're seeing a reduction of over 60% um, in fuel wood. This is mostly because the stove is efficient and um, does reduce wood, but also you're using smaller pieces of wood. You can use agricultural residues, so um, there's just much less wood usage um, with the stove. Looking at frequency, so again, when we ask for, when we ask households what their uh, primary stove is, that doesn't necessarily mean exclusive use of um, the EcoZoom stove. There's a newer term in, in the literature called stacking, um, and that includes households that are using multiple stoves or multiple fuel sources. And, and this is pretty common um, in the literature as far as behavior um, when you're introducing a new uh, stove or fuel technology. And what you'll see here is of cooking events, basically what this table tells you is of cooking events, about 80% of them are performed on an EcoZoom stove. The majority of the rest of them are, are on a three-stone fire. And what you're seeing below there is a pie chart of when asked why you continue to use your old stove, um, why is this happening, the majority of households said that they had a need to use multiple stoves. So a lot of the times uh, folks are cooking, on, are cooking two dishes at once. They need two stoves. Um, if they have a lot of people over, things like that. 
um, some households talking about needing a light source or warming the house. Um, some additional ones in there that are important are um, the use of wet wood. Um, it's, we discourage use of, of wet wood. Um, and then some other things in fire tending, and I'll talk about that as well. Additionally, we looked at stove limitations, so a reason why you weren't using the EcoZoom stove. The primary one there is is this wet wood issue, and basically we message against using wet wood, but um, if, it's, if it's raining, which it rains a lot in Rwanda, we still want them to use the stove, so it's actually a little bit easier to use a three-stone fire with wet wood, so you have to really um, work on that, that message. Um, difficult using, that's a little bit ambiguous, but what that really comes down to is high frequency of fire tending. What you see with a lot of uh, improved cook stoves is um, while they're faster, um, at cooking, you still have to sit there and actually tend the fire more because you're using smaller pieces of wood where with a three-stone fire, you see people piling on a lot of wood. They put their beans on and then they go perform other household tasks. So it's a huge behavior change to get people, even though it does cook faster, um, they still have to tend the fire. So that's seen as a disadvantage for them. Um, also, a lot of these things also came out during a focus group that we had. Again, the fire tending was a huge issue. Um, inability to use wet wood, cooking multiple things at, the, at one time, um, and, some, and some issues with large pots. So when you, look, when you cook with a large pot, it's very difficult um, to cook meals with it, and so it's, they would rather use a three-stone fire. Moving on to the filter side of things, um, on reported filter use, so this is asking someone the last time you treated, or the last time you drank water, did you treat it, yes or no? And then if they said yes, um, what did you use to treat your water? In that case, 95% of households reported um, the use of the life straw filter. On the observational side, the community health worker goes and checks and sees if there's water actually in the filter at the time of the visit. Um, and when you look at that metric, we're averaging around 90%. So again, when I was talking about reported versus um, observed use, um, what you'll normally see with a good observational metric is, is you know, slightly a slight reduction in reported value. Um, the reason that we see this is that um, people, people tend to over-report in their surveys. Um, this is probably because of what we call a courtesy bias, where you know they want to impress you and they want to say they're using a technology. So we do try to look at our program both on a reported scale and, and an observational scale. Um, looking at this, we, again, don't see much difference between rounds um, as far as adoption numbers. Quantity of water treated. Uh, this is an extremely important metric for us in our program, both from a carbon perspective and from a health perspective. Uh, we advise people to drink two liters per person per day. Uh, the life straw container itself is you pour water in and it's about it's a six liter container and it'll treat six liters depending on the, the quality of the water in about two hours. Um, and so what we're seeing is across liters per household per day, we're seeing about six liters per household per day. So most people are filling up their container or um, filling up their life straw once per day. That translates to about um, a liter to a liter and a half per person per day. So this is one of the metrics that we really are working on as far as getting people to drink more water, and this includes bringing water with them and, and some of the messaging around that. Uh, some of the limitations that we saw with the life straw um, mostly included um, things from the filter being broken. Um, and, and this wasn't actually filters being broken. It actually just required a backwash, um, but we learned a lot about messaging and, and filter backwashing and how to rapid backwash filters. Um, there's instances of tubes being eaten by mice um, and some other hardware issues um, that have actually mostly been resolved with the manufacturer. Now, um, there's a little bit of difficulty in the actual cleaning procedure, but again, that's um, done through behavior change and messaging. Um, the low personal consumption I talked about as far as two liters per person per day and this disinterest in carrying filtered water to work in school. So a huge problem is that in the home, they're drinking life straw treated water, but then when they go to the fields and they go to school, they're then drinking whatever water is available. And so we have to do a lot of messaging and a lot of behavior change around um, carrying water with you. 
just some additional findings that are kind of interesting is, you know, in those RCT villages, the ones that the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine were in and, and, and the households that we were in as well, is we saw survey fatigue. Um, you know, like I said, one of the important parts of our program is that we go see people all the time, but <laughs> you can see people too much and, and survey fatigue can be an issue. Um, interestingly enough, many households are actually sharing their life straw treated water. So someone will come in from another village to work in a field and it's just common practice in Rwanda to go into, go into someone's house and ask for some water. So there's a lot of sharing of water. And that's interesting for us from a carbon perspective because we want to quantify how many liters per person per day are being treated. Um, also the findings were that during this phase one of the program, we really just looked at household visits. Um, so we've been suggested to do additional avenues of health messaging, which we're looking at right now, including radio and existing MOH channels, Ministry of Health channels. Um, so we'll be moving into those phases soon. And then also just a general future market potential. Um, at the beginning, before we, before we kind of messaged against it, we did have people, some people selling their stoves and filters. Um, so we do think there's a market for it and people expressed interest in wanting to buy them. So back to some common filter and stove maintenance and repair issues. I talked a little bit about these as far as hardware for water filters, rodent seeding tubes, clogged filters, um, and some sediment or algae in the safe water storage um, uh, device. These have mostly all been addressed through a redesign, um, small modifications to the actual um, technology itself, which will be implemented during full rollout. Uh, on the stove side, you see pot skirt and stick support deterioration. Um, this will be addressed through different material selection, but many of the many pot skirts and stick supports in a lot of these stoves are, are degrade very quickly. It's very high heat, and so you see this a lot in improved cook stoves um, and things like handles coming loose. Um, but again, these are being addressed through the manufacturer. Looking um, at the program as a whole, the benefits and the sustainability of the program, basically the program is going to provide water quality, improved water quality and reduced indoor air pollution for over 600,000 households in Rwanda. Again, this is a third of the country. Um, we're talking about three, three to four million people um, who are affected by the program. Reduction in fuel wood usage, so reduction of deforestation currently happening in the country. Uh, monetary, monetary savings from less purchase of fuel wood and reduce time spent collecting fuel wood um, by the households. Um, again, this is a 20-year program. Uh, we work on technology transfer during that 20-year program. We work with community health workers. This, at full scale, will work with at least 2,500 community health workers. We'll be training them, and they will be in households, um, training uh, households every month or every six months on how to use the technologies and be responsible for community trainings. Um, we're also looking in the long term to do some of the manufacturing um, and assembly in country. Um, this is going to be established uh, hopefully by year four, but we would like to move to at least local assembly of some of these products um, later. As I mentioned before, we have an extensive monitoring, verification, and research program. This is incredibly important for us from both the carbon side and also um, what we think is transparency and accountability in our organization. We have independent studies going on um, with London School of Hygiene and Tro Tropical Medicine. We're always looking at behavior change and public health impacts of our, of our program. Um, we're also working with a sensor platform that gives us an objective measure of use. Um, where we where we look at survey questions and how they can be improved by what people what a, what the sensor is actually reporting. Um, we're also looking at life cycle analysis and, and looking at if our products are um, for repair and recycling if, if they're doing if we can do a full life cycle analysis of that. Um, so yeah, that's a summary of our program, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Christina, thank you so much. Christina, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. It's excellent work that you're doing, obviously, and we, I think we're all very fortunate to have the chance to learn more about it from you firsthand, and particularly at this nexus of technology adoption as well as financing in a very uh, unique program indeed is carbon financing. 
And so to have a chance to interact with you and now upcoming ask questions about your work is quite a fortunate opportunity for us. So everyone who has questions, please ask those in the Q&A box below, and we will be forwarding those questions on to Christina so that she can answer and present uh, further on the areas you're interested to dive in deeper. So one of the questions that I had is I'm curious to understand more about the finances behind this. Behind every single project, certainly in order for us to have the impact we desire, we, we need it to work out in the long term, of course. And I'm curious if you might be able to speak more to the numbers about who's paying for the stoves and the water filters at what time, how much money is coming back uh, as a result of the carbon financing, when that's coming back, who's taking on the risk. So if you don't mind, I'd be interested if you can go into some of those details. Sure. So I, I can't go into into a lot of detail because this isn't um, more on the actual implementation side, but I'll, I'll just talk briefly about um, kind of our, our financing mechanism. So again, one of our primary financing mechanisms is the carbon is carbon revenue. Um, when you work with uh, carbon, when you work with carbon revenue, and also the NAMA, which I talked a little bit about, um, you have an upfront investment, and, and you work with that, and then you get paid back through those carbon credits, um, through the issuance of those carbon credits. Um, in a nutshell, that's pretty much the entire story. And I'm sorry, I can't be be more have more details with you about that. But basically, our strategy is carbon financing, NAMAs, which are very, very closely tied to carbon financing, and then also the development of a retail market. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, we're really lucky in that we have an investor, and, and we, we work very closely with them, and, and, and the program is, is um, funded in that way. But it's, we're a for-profit business. This is a private sector, private sector project working with the government um, and also donors as well. But... Um, we, we work on a pay-for-performance model where both of these, where carbon finance and NAMAs allow you to um, only get paid for actually performing and showing results. Okay, great. And it looks like we had a few other questions related to that that had a few sub-questions, so I'll follow up with those. One of them is, what is the cost of the kit and the replacement cartridges? and who's financing that kit and the replacements? In other words, at the end of the program, also who will be paying for those replacements and spare parts? That question is coming from Peter. Right. Um, so basically what you see is um, the carbon credits continue to, you continue to get them over when, as they're being issued. So as long as people are using the technologies, we still continue to make uh, money on carbon credits. Um, but we may move to also mechanisms of people um, paying for replacements and, and things like that. Um, again, uh, the main thing on the water filter is the kind of the cartridge being replaced, um, and that's every three to five years. Um, so that's what you would see. But we don't know yet if we're going to do pay for replacement um, or if we, if we would fund the whole thing. But we do continue to make revenue through carbon credits um, as people are continuing to use them. Okay, got it. Great. And one last coming from Peter. He's curious to know if you can uh, go into explaining about the breakdown of the program costs. What percentage goes to goods supplied, to salaries, overhead, cost of communication, for example, the monitoring and the smartphones and the sensors that you're using? I really, I really can't go into that. Um, it is a large program. It's a $60 million program. Um, a lot of that is directly um, related to the actual financing or the actual technologies themselves and the cost of them, but I, I really uh, can't go into the actual financials of that. Okay. All right. Um, we have a question coming from Devin who asks, is there any community investment in these products? Do the people pay a portion of the cost? Um, so there is not community investment through actual cost of the products. Um, what, what we do see in community investment is, is Rwanda has really, really strong um, village level, community level um, interaction. And so at the community level, people see these technologies, they work with them. We do, again, household education. 
and that's where the investment comes in. Um, Rwanda is very much known for um, a lot of these community aspects and people um, working towards these health outcomes. So no, it's not in the way that they've invested money. And through our retail campaign, it will be it will be that way when we target the the higher households. But the households that we're targeting right now um, are not in the market. They are don't have enough income to support the, um, the purchase of either technology. So we work more in a health campaign style for those lower two. Um, economic classes where when you do move into the, the higher economic classes and, and people want to purchase them, um, there's that part. But we do this more as a campaign health health style um, health style campaign. I see. Great. And what have been the largest cultural obstacles to successful implementation of the program? That question is coming from Lucy. Sure. So um, one of the biggest obstacles is really behavior change with um, stove use. I think um, cooking is, you know, very much in, in one's culture and in the way you cook and, and how often you cook and, and your everyday um, routine of, of cooking. So getting people to change that behavior is, is extremely difficult. And, and what you see, like I mentioned before, is this stove stacking thing where people don't completely move over to the new stove and maybe they use their three stone fire still for certain activities. Um, like I was saying with fire tending, maybe something that takes longer, they may use their three stone fire. So, I mean, the biggest the biggest hurdles in, in these programs are behavior change. It's extremely difficult um, um, to really to really get people to use these technologies when you don't have constant engagement. So what we do is we spend a lot of time with people um, in their homes talking through the technologies because, you know, behavior change is very difficult. And, and we want them, we don't want them just um, to use the technologies, but to want to use the technologies. So going through things like benefits of cook stoves and and a big thing with the with cook stoves is three stone fires and the disadvantages of three stone fires and um, they use more wood. It's very bad for your health. Those type of things. So definitely um, on the behavior change side, um, we have have those challenges. Got it. And have you been able to document any health improvements among participants? Certainly not. We have not done that yet. That's actually a study that will be conducted by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine during the full campaign. So in order to really get health outcomes, you need to have large, large samples. So they will do a separate um, randomized control trial during our full campaign next summer to really get at those health outcomes. Right now, they're really looking at um, exposure reduction. So right now, they're looking at if the water that people are drinking is better for them and also is their indoor air improving. So right now it's exposure reduction um, and then um, during the full rollout you'll start to see some of those health outcomes coming out of it. Sure, that makes sense. In terms of exposure reduction to um, either the water contaminants or the um, particulates and gases uh, from the cook stoves, are you looking and monitoring at individual exposures, and is that one of your metrics, or is it simply uh, looking at the reduced exposure of, uh, or the reduced emissions, for example, of the cook stove? So, with a cook stove, um, again, this is a this is a really kind of a tricky question, especially on the exposure side for cook stoves, because people cook in multiple locations. So, a uh, what? What London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine does is they actually kind of, they measure emissions from where people are cooking. So if that's outdoors or indoors or in a separate cook, in a separate kitchen, um, mostly monitoring CO and CO2 and then particulate matter. On the water side, you're looking at uh, basically a, a micro, a microbiological indicator of um, of reduction. So they they ask people where do you get your water from. So they look at water sources. They look at and then where directly they drink water from, um, and they they do a, a reduction based an exposure reduction based on those values. Got it. And another question that we had was looking at: Do you, in addition to the quantitative data and metrics that you're collecting, do you also look at qualitative metrics? One example being the end user's satisfaction from the system. Certainly. So we also conduct focus groups 
and that's primarily how we get a lot of our qualitative data, As asking people why they like it, why they don't like it. This is incredibly important, and you get a lot of really interesting things just from sitting down at focus groups, and, and qualitative data is extremely important. Um, but we do additionally ask during our surveys, um, how, can, how would you improve this technology? Um, what don't you like, and what do you like? And we can get a lot of interesting feedback on, um, on, our, on the technologies um, because of that. Another person is curious to know about what were some of the major political or government policy challenges and support that you had received? Certainly. So um, Rwanda is a very, very stable country. Um, they have a really strong government. And so um, we work very, very closely with them on this program. As I mentioned, the Ministry of Health is the primary partner on this program. Um, so we don't actually see a lot of those kind of bottlenecks of um, development that you see in a lot of places. Um, um, there's almost no corruption in Rwanda, and it's um, a relatively easy place to work in that way. Um, with that said, you're still working in a developing community. Um, things are just inherently more difficult just for the fact that they're more difficult. Um, and, so, and so you do spend a lot of time um, taking meetings and, and, and working through um, those type of issues. But relative to a lot of developing countries, Rwanda is a, a, an easy place to work in that we do have strong government support. Again, we are using their network of um, community health workers. Uh, we're using about 150 right now at full scale. We'll use more in the, in the thousands level. But the community health worker program in Rwanda is 45,000 community health workers. And so you have a very, very strong system set up um, at the village level for um, community health. Great. We also have a question about the composition of the people who are both designing this program as well as the people who are on the ground implementing and executing the program. Do you mind breaking it out for us? What percentage are from local in each of those aspects, and which percentage are coming from um, the outside? Certainly. Um, so our local staff, our local full-time staff that is, all, is on our program is about 12 or maybe 15 now. Um, but again, at full scale, um, we will have an additional probably 40 to 50 local full-time staff, but we work with 4,000 community health workers. Those are all, that's all local. Um, coming in, you know, expats are myself and two others that work in Rwanda that live there full time. And then we have um, kind of parent support from the program director and also from Del Agua themselves. So um, the management of, of a lot of this comes from myself and two or three others with counterparts that we have locally. And then the rest of the program is through um, local, through Rwandan-based employment. Great. Now, I think it's so easy for us to be asking questions about the, the work and the professional side. But I'm curious, either on the personal or the professional side, what have been some of the greatest challenges and learnings for you? I think all of us, uh, you know, certainly as we're in the field and, and doing our, our work, it's, we come, ago, uh, come up against many different obstacles, and so learning um, some of the things that you've faced uh, would be interesting. Um, certainly. I mean, again, I've talked about this before, but behavior change is just is one of those really, really difficult things that um, we spend a lot of time in. And I'm in, coming from an engineering background. It's sometimes difficult to really sink yourself into behavior change and what that means. And it can be extremely frustrating um, to, to not understand someone's motives, and, and that's probably the most challenging thing for me, and it's what I'm focused on all the time, is, is figuring out why people do what they do and, and how, how to get people to you know, adopt these technologies, which we, we want them to do um, from a health perspective. So it can be, it can be challenging. Um, you're obviously working in a different environment. In Rwanda, it's, Rwanda is this incredibly hilly country. It sits at about five to 6,000 feet, um, depending on what type of, uh, what 
part of the hill you're on, but this is called the land of a thousand hills, and I think there's probably 10,000 hills in this country. So it's a really difficult place to get around as far as um, going, doing a village visit for me involves about five to six hours of hiking up and down hills. Um, so again, when you're trying to get into households and really see what people are doing, that, that can also be fairly challenging. I can imagine. <laughs> you might suffer from uh, altitude sickness at times. Well, good thing I'm from Colorado, so <laughs> that's good. That does help. Another person is curious to know about, uh, in terms of increasing the adoption and the campaign work that you've been doing, if you can describe more about the education component and whether the whether offering information and helping to educate people about the hygienic advantages of filtered water in the stoves has had traction. Um, so from the hygiene perspective, uh, are you talking about, sorry, I'm just trying to clarify the question. So on the, for drinking water, for the water, we message for people to use it only for drinking water. The reason that we do that is we, we think that's the most important um, health outcome for that. Um, but ad additionally, people do use it sometimes for hand washing and, and things like that, and, and we encourage um, hygiene behaviors as well. But our primary focus is on um, the use of the water filter for drinking water. And the reason we do that is it lasts longer if you use it um, for that purpose. But, um, but just generally talking about the training and education and getting a little bit more in depth with that, um, we spend a couple of days training our community health workers on how to use a smartphone and how to use the technologies and going through benefits um, so that they understand really what they're talking to people about and, and they can field questions in a household very easily. Fortunately for us, Rwanda has done a really good job specifically on the water side of, of informing people that they should treat their water. So people already have this uh, perception that they should be drinking their water, which is really, or be drinking clean water, which is really great. Um, we have a lot more work to do on the stove side as far as um, trying to get that behavior across as um, that being very bad and, and, and things like that. Another great thing about Rwanda is that people really do listen to health messaging when, when it comes down from the Minister of Health or when it comes through MOH or if it comes through the government. And so using um, those already existing methods that they use to educate is incredibly important and in that people do respond um, to messaging from the minister about drinking clean water um, or hopefully cooking practices in the future. That's great to hear about the of the top-down governmental support and how much influence and uh, benefit that that's seen for community members as well as for you in doing your work. I think we have time for very one, uh, one last brief question, which is looking at what marketing mechanisms have you seen to be most successful in the exploration you've been doing about what are the best ways to be getting the word out? And particularly, are there mechanisms for reaching the most rural, most remote people that you have found to be successful? Certainly. So um, I'll start with our market-based trials um, are just beginning. But I would say that so far what we've really found and what we think we're going to see is that um, a lot of the market side of, of the program is actually going to come through co-ops, local co-ops, be it a teacher co-op or um, community health worker co-op, um, and the use of financing through those mechanisms. Um, as far as the question related to how do you reach the most rural person, that's what we're doing with the health campaign. So the folks that are the furthest out, that are the poorest, are the ones we're doing a health campaign with, with a free distribution. Um, on the retail side, the folks that are closer in, um, that are, are a little higher up on the economic class, they're going to, um, we're going to look at them from a market perspective. But those folks that are, are in the lower economic classes are getting, are getting the stove and filters for free. And thus, we are focusing on them from an adoption and health campaign side, whereas those higher, those higher um, economic classes we're looking at more on the retail side. And we think that's going to be through the use of co-ops um, and building the capacity there. Got it. Great. Well, Christina, thank you so much. This has really been a wonderful presentation. It's been I think, a, a pleasure and an excellent opportunity for all of us to learn more about the work and the great things that you're doing in Rwanda, and we wish you all the success.
And I also want to so take much. a moment to thank all of the attendees for participating in today's webinar. This wouldn't be the same without you as, as well. So on the screen now, you'll see the PDH code and email address should you wish to earn a professional de development hour. And if you have any questions about the webinar series, feel free to email the webinars team. Someone asked about a copy of the presentation. The presentation has been recorded. It will be available online. And finally, don't forget to become an E4C member to never miss a webinar announcement again. So thank you again, Christina. This has really been um, a true great opportunity for all of us to learn from you. So we really appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to everyone. Thanks so much. And certainly, if um, my email address that was up there earlier, if anybody has any questions, happy to, to take any of them. So thanks a bunch. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you. for On behalf of the Engineering for Change team, we want to wish you a pleasant day, evening, or night, and look forward to seeing you next time.